Are you? Are you his? I hope so. Has he reminded you of who you are and you know that you are his and you know that you're in him and that he's in you? I sure hope so. Because that is so true. We are like a flower quickly fading. We really are. It's here today and gone tomorrow. A vapor in the wind. That's what the Bible said. We're but a vapor. Life is so short. But the devil is so deceitful and this world is so deceitful and our flesh is so, de de so deceitful. So um, be reminded, life is short. We're not promised tomorrow. Well, listen, I'm going to do something uh, a little bit unique this morning. I'm going to preach to you a message I've preached before, but in a different light this morning. I want to preach this in light of what we've heard for the last five weeks. For the last several weeks, we've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the last several weeks, by the grace of God, as best as I know how, I've shared with you the truth from the word of God of the good news of Jesus Christ. The full gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures and that he was seen. And we talked about last week that he went back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father and we talked about because of what he did, we can have peace, peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with others, peace with death. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter two that he has removed the fear of death for us because he tasted death for us. He was able to remove the fear of death for us and, and free us from being slaves of being fearful of death. Because remember, we talked about death. Our final enemy is catching up to us every day. We don't know when he'll overtake us, but he will. And the most awesome news in the world is that Christ has already been there. He's already tasted death for us, for those who know him. And he came out on the other side, amen, hallelujah, and he took the sting out of death. He got the victory over death. So we can say, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? And uh, we don't have to be afraid of death anymore because death is a fearful thing because it's somewhat the unknown. But praise the Lord Jesus has removed that fear and he's delivered us from that. And we can know that today. So the full gospel, that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He was seen by many witnesses for over 40 days. He went back to heaven. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, signifying that he's the great high priest. No priest was able to sit down in the Old Testament because their work was never done, because the sins of the people continued. So the priest had to continually make sacrifices for the people for their sins, but Jesus, the final, the great high priest, came and made the final sacrifice, sacrificing himself. He died, tasting death for us. He rose from the dead. He finished his work. He sat down, and anybody who will turn to Jesus, look to Jesus, believe in Jesus, bow their lives to Jesus, can enter into that rest with him. Rest from trying to save yourself by living a good life and uh, rest one day ultimately when we go to heaven from all the battles of sin and all the battles that we have on this earth. Amen, that's the full gospel. So what are you going to do with it? What have you done with the full gospel? I want to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ is mighty to save. And that's what I want to share with you in a different light this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And, uh, yeah, we've shared this at Christmas a few times. But let's look at it this morning in light of hearing the gospel. The Bible says in Matthew 1, 21, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. I should be like Dr. Charles Stanley when you get there, say amen. <laughs> That's pretty good. Amen. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Dr. Stanley, amen. Matthew 1 21 says, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, Old Testament, for salvation. That's what that word is. 
for he will save his people from their sins. And you don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1b, God says, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's Jesus. He's mighty to save. We've heard the gospel. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that you would open hearts of those listening on, online, those who are here this morning. Speak. Get me out of the way. And Lord Jesus, that they may see you. In your name we pray and preach. Amen. So yeah, I realize we've shared this message uh, passage with you before. But today, preaching it in a different light, like the author of Hebrews said over and over in those first few chapters, today, today is the day of salvation. And today, if you hear his voice, the author of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We have a new day today. We have a window of opportunity, which is today, which is your life which is you here right now hearing the preaching of the gospel. Today, it's a window of opportunity for every person today to not harden your heart, but to hear the gospel and respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a warning there to the people in the book of Hebrews who had made a profession of faith, a warning to make sure that they really had real saving faith and not be like the Israelites in the wilderness when God tested them and their hearts were hardened and they did not really believe and they lived in disobedience and they never were able to enter the promised land. That's a picture of those today who say they believe in Jesus, but really their lives haven't changed and it might not be real saving faith. And if it's not real saving faith in Jesus, you will be like those Israelites who died and was not able to enter the promised land, you'll be like them and you won't be able to enter into heaven because it wasn't real saving faith. Because you heard the gospel, but it wasn't an accompanied, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't coupled with faith. And because it wasn't coupled with faith, their lives were full of disobedience to God. Would that be you today? Would you say that you're saved? but you've heard the gospel and you really haven't had faith in your heart, therefore your life hasn't really changed? I hope not. So it was a warning to them in Hebrews to make sure they had really believed in Jesus Christ with real saving faith. So with us hearing the gospel over the last several weeks for Easter, have you heard it? Have you really heard it in your heart? Did it pierce your heart? Like Hebrews 4 says, the, the Bible, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart. Did the gospel do that to you in the last few weeks? Did you let it judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart? Did you realize what the Bible says? That every creature is open and laid bare before him. No one is hidden in his sight, but every creature is open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. We are all open. Our lives are continually open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So I want us to see today because of who Jesus is and what he's done for sinners. And I want us to be reminded that he's really mighty to save. He's mighty to save from the guttermost to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Jesus Christ. Now, you know I love to hear testimonies. I love to hear how people came to know Jesus. And uh, I, I remember uh, uh, there was a guy named Julian. Sometimes he'll come visit us from time to time. He came to church when he was, uh, when he was a young teenager. And he told me the story of watching some preacher on YouTube and God just opened his eyes to the gospel and he turned from his sins and trusted in Jesus. Then Caleb, one of Caleb's best friends, came in and went off to the Navy. I remember he attended uh, our church one night and he was uh, at an evening service and God just showed up. You know, like we talked about this past Wednesday night, God just showed up. God showed up that Wednesday night and kids wouldn't go home. I don't know if y'all remember that night, but all the kids just wanted to stay. Nobody wanted to get up and get on the bus and go home. And it was just an unusual night. And and some of the kids were crying and coming to the altar. And as I recall, Tavian was one of the ones that night that God opened his eyes and saved him and, and uh, uh, changed his life. 
Then I think about Miss Lucy. She's not with us. I, maybe you're watching us. You said you watch our messages, Miss Lucy. Praise the Lord. I wonder, Miss Lucy, if you remember when you and your daughter were gloriously saved and baptized there in the cow trough behind, beside the road there outside at New, New Art Baptist Church on Carolina Avenue. Miss Lucy's life was changed forever. And she still loves the Lord and still talks about the Lord. And because of where she lives now and her schedule, she's not able to be with us. But we're praying and we're, we're working on her to get her to be able to come back and be with us. I think about Ed Jones, who uh, who was my one of my EMS partners many years ago. And then we reunited when I went back to EMS and worked part-time about 15 years ago or so. And we were riding together and, and uh, we were just talking about our lives. And I just started sharing with Ed, you know, the truth that, Maybe I wasn't really saved when I thought I was as a young boy because I got off in a lot of sins and did a lot of things that believers really shouldn't be doing. And, and uh, then I really heard the truth when I was like 24 years old. And, and uh, God really opened my eyes to the truth of the cross and what Jesus did for me. And it was then that he woke me up and showed me my sin and my need to bow my life to Jesus. And I believe it was that night that he really saved me. And then my life started to really change. And I was sharing that with Ed. And Ed said, wow. wow. And then eventually Ed was gloriously saved um, not too long after that. And just about three or four years ago, um, I preached Ed's funeral. And I was able to share that story. He went to be with the Lord at 57, 58 years old. But he's in heaven because Jesus saved him. Uh, I saw one of our girls who was in middle school when she used to come to church here and now she's graduated from high school and she said Pastor Kenny I'm still saved because of you and I, I want to say now I want to make sure it's because of Jesus not because of me and I hope she really is really saved but I'm telling you I just want you to know there are so many stories and I want you to know that Jesus Christ is mighty to save and I want to be I want us to be a part in what he's doing and I want us to join God and let him use us and be willing to be used by him to share the gospel with people and see people saved. But what I want to share with you this morning in the time that we have, just a few more minutes. Matthew 1, 21, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I want us to see, first of all, this morning, Christ really is saving a people for his glory. Jesus Christ really is saving a people. He really is. That's the central point of view of history from God's view, the salvation of a people. You know, the very central event in history is the cross of Jesus Christ. The reason Jesus came that I've shared with you over the last five weeks is that Christ died for our sins. And the Apostle Paul said it is a trustworthy statement worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. So if you feel like you're the chief of sinners, I want you to know the central point in history is the cross of Jesus Christ where Jesus died to save even the worst of sinners. And right now, he's still calling out a people for his name. Right now, he's still saving a people for his glory. That's the whole message of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. When God looked on history, he saw mankind, all of us, throughout all of history, in a terrible predicament of sin. And God, from before the foundation of the world, had already planned to send his son into this world to save men, women, boys, and girls from their sins and from the pits of eternal separation from God in hell. It started in the Bible that God started saving a people with Adam and Eve, the very first man and woman on this earth. When they sinned and disobeyed God, what happened? God should have stricken them immediately and sent them to hell. But mercy and grace from God as he clothed them with skins. That was the first sacrifice of blood by God pointing to the ultimate sacrifice that would be Jesus that was able to save Adam and Eve, the first man and woman saved from their sins. And then their son Abel, who was killed by his own brother because Abel was a true believer and his brother wasn't. And Abel had real genuine faith and was mightily saved by Jesus. Noah, the Bible says, found grace in the eyes of God and God saved him and his family through the ark. And the ark is a picture of Jesus. 
that Moses preached for all those years, water's coming, rain's coming, people were partying and laughing and, and living in sensual pleasures and laughing at Mo uh, Noah, saying, where's the rain? You're funny. You fill that boat. We're going to enjoy our lives. And then we know what happened. God sent the floodwaters and the ark was the safety for Noah and all of his family. And Jesus, uh, the God's wrath is coming one day and Jesus is our ark. He's our safety. He's the only one we can be safe from the wrath of God in. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, who murdered somebody, Joshua, Caleb, Samuel, David, even though he committed adultery and murder, was still saved by the mighty hand of God through the blood of Jesus. Manasseh, the meanest, most wicked man in all of the world, was saved by the grace of God. Peter, a rough, cursing, deceitful man, lying, cursing, swearing fisherman, was saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus, a cheating tax collector, was saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. The woman at the well who had five husbands and was shacking up with the man she wasn't even married to was saved by the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, an enemy of Christians and the church and of Jesus, was saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen, the first martyr, was saved by Jesus. And then go on through church history. Martin Luther was saved through reading the book of Romans. John Newton, a great slave trader, and a wicked man, an alcohol-drinking, fighting, slave-owner man, was saved by the grace of God, and he wrote that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And he wrote many more songs that are awesome. You ought to look them up. Susanna Wesley, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, Billy Sunday, Dwight L. Moody, Fanny Crosby, Billy Graham, Ruth Graham, Charles Stanley, Jim Elliott, Elizabeth Elliott, the tribe, tribal people that he was killed by, many of them were later saved. I'm just telling you, the Bible says in Revelation 5 verse 9, that Jesus Christ has redeemed people out of every kindred, every tongue, every people, and every nation when we get to heaven. There will be people from every kindred, every tongue, every people, and every nation. God is saving a people all across this world from every nation, from every city, from every race, from every tribe, Jesus Christ is saving a people for his glory. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And those people will form a multitude in heaven, singing praises to Jesus forever and ever and ever. Yeah, Jesus is saving a people. And he commanded us as the church to make our supreme goal in history right now to go out and tell every creature the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's still saving the people, folks. He'll save you if you'll respond to him today. If you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart. It's urgent. When you hear his voice, it's urgent that you respond and run to Jesus. Because if you don't, your heart will harden. And if you say no today, it'll harden. And then the next time you hear the gospel, you won't be so sensitive to it. And it'll be easier to say no. Till eventually, every time you hear the gospel, you're just totally hardened to it. And it doesn't even bother you or convict you anymore. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Come to Jesus. But not only must we realize that Jesus Christ is saving a people for his glory, we need to realize how he's saving a people. He is mighty to save. Jesus is mightily saving a people. Not only is he saving a people, the Bible says in Matthew 121, she will bring forth a son and you should call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You see it? He will do it. And he will save them from their sins. If you go over to Ephesians chapter 2, You'll see, we don't want to turn there, but you look at it sometime. In Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses describe us before we were saved, and the first three verses describe every person right now if they're not saved. And it talks about right now, if you're not saved, you are dead 
in your trespasses and sins. You are walking, living your life according to the course of the world, following Satan. He's the one you're following. He's the one you're living for, even though you might not realize that. Dead in trespasses and sins. When we think about that, the Bible says uh, in Romans 3.11, there's none who understands. There's none that seeks after God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's why, you know, some people say, uh, some people say we're drowning in the ocean and Jesus comes and rescues us. And I've used that illustration before, but you know the real biblical picture is that we're already dead and at the bottom of the sea. And Jesus comes down and makes us alive spiritually and brings us to life. That's how mighty he is to save us, folks. He can take you in your dark condition of sin and rebellion and living and laughing maybe at this message right now and thinking this isn't for me and you're living in sin and living your life and thinking you'll never die and God is so mighty to save he's able to wake you up right now through the preaching of my my little feeble uh, weak preaching as I can right now he's able to wake you up and make you realize whoa I am a sinner God is speaking to me I do need to be saved he's able to make you alive right now and respond to Jesus He's mighty to save, folks. He really is. Salvation is the working of the Father calling a sinner to Jesus Christ. And I think it's awesome how uh, Charles Spurgeon said that Jesus is not only mighty to save those who repent, but he's able to make men repent. That's awesome. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe you hear the gospel God opens your eyes to your sin you don't think about anybody else you don't care who's around you know right now you are in the presence laid open and fair with the one for whom we have to do and that's the Lord Jesus Christ that's the God of this universe God's able to open your eyes right now and make you see how open and laid bare you are. Every thought, every secret thought in your mind, every secret secret sin you're in right now, every secret sinful thing you say is laid open to the God of this universe right now. And God's able, and I hope he does, wake some of you up to that right now, that you realize I'm in the high eyes of Almighty God and he knows everything I did and said and thought yesterday. And it's only by the grace of God that I'm still here. And he's able to wake you up and let you hear the gospel message so that you would repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now. And he'll save you and he'll change your life. That's how mighty he is to save folks. We, we go preach, we witness. That's how God saves people. As the gospel is given to a person, they hear and they respond. The Bible says in Romans 1.16 that it is the gospel that's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. The church isn't the power of God for salvation. Us trying to work up and have a revival here, that's not the power of God under salvation. Not eloquent speaking or preaching, that's not the power of God under salvation. Not how many programs we can do at the church, that's not the power of God uh, to salvation. But the Bible says it's the gospel. That's the power of God to salvation. That's why I'm not embarrassed to preach it again this week. I'm not embarrassed to preach it again next week. I'm not embarrassed if you get tired of hearing it. I'm telling you the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself and you will be in hell if you don't repent and believe in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel and that's the true gospel. And I'm telling you, you better believe in Jesus today while he's speaking. I love... Um, I love uh, Brother Joe. He's going to be coming and preaching for us again some this, uh, this summer. And uh, man, I remember Joe, uh, he'll have to tell you his testimony sometime. He doesn't like to tell it a lot because he didn't want you to think that you have to have his experience to get saved. And that's true. That's true. People are saved in di different circumstances in different ways. And some people are saved like Joe, who was on drugs and uh, living for the devil and he got saved at a crusade outside one night he heard the gospel preached he found himself at the altar crying out to God for mercy and he says I don't even know how I got there I just found myself at the altar crying to Jesus to save me and he saved me and I got up a new person and I never did drugs again and he's been living for Jesus ever since some people are saved 
uh, like that and they're changed overnight, other people change gradually. Sanctification's a process. He's still working on us, but I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is mightily saving a people. And if you would be like the publican in Luke chapter 15, not even able to look up because he saw his sinfulness in the sight of holy God, but this beating on his breast, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you're willing to do that, humble yourself before God, he will be merciful to you. Jesus will save you because he is saving people mightily. Um, I'm thinking about Charles Spurgeon was telling some stories that I read just recently. And he said, a lot of times I preach sermons that I intended to comfort believers and sinners ended up getting saved and I didn't even have any intent of that. He told the story about one son of a dad. He told the story about a dad who came to him with a folded up letter in his pocket. And he said, Mr. Spurgeon, I just want to thank you for being the means that God used to save my son. He said, uh, my son ran off in rebellion and said, I'm leaving home. And he left home in rebellion. And he said, I'm going to America um, from England. And uh, he wrote his dad a letter. He said, Dad, I'm in America now. I just want to tell you something happened on my way to America. And I got held up. And I ended up uh, finding the Lord Jesus Christ. And now I've joined a church in America. And I hope for the rest of my life I will be living for him. But what happened, Dad, was before I left England, I ended up at... Uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon's church and I heard Mr. Spurgeon preach and God woke me up and saved me that day and uh, he reached in his pocket that dad did and gave that letter to, uh, to Mr. Spurgeon and he had found out that his son had died in America and he's in heaven now the dad said and he said I just wanted to thank you Mr. Spurgeon for being the means that God used to save my son and Mr. Spurgeon, Preacher Spurgeon said, we both just rejoiced and had a rejoicing party. Then he told another story about another young boy who had come to hear him preach. And he was saved that morning and he went to get on a boat to go somewhere and had an accident on that boat and he died. But uh, Spurgeon said he was saved and then a few hours, a few hours later he found himself in heaven. His parents got a letter from him as well saying he had found the Savior, and they were so excited, then immediately they received the news of his boating accident and that he had drowned. Folks, I just want you to know, Jesus Christ is mightily saving a people. He'll save you today. If you'll come to him, will you bow to Jesus today? Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. But then thirdly and lastly, what I want us to see is not only Jesus is saving a people, not only is he mightily saving a people, but thirdly, the Bible says Jesus Christ is saving a people from their sins. That's awesome. And I want you to know this morning, carefully what the Bible says. Does it say he shall save his people in their sins? It's not what it says, is it? He shall save his people from their sins. See, there's a teaching today that says you can be saved, but not necessarily from your sins. Come to Jesus as you are, and by the way, feel free to stay that way. Come to Jesus for your free ticket to heaven. Enjoy the benefits of salvation, but you don't have to submit to him as Lord. So I just want you to know, I don't want to give anybody a false hope today and tell you that if you prayed a prayer and said yes to Jesus, you are for sure saved and going to heaven. Not if your life hasn't changed. Not if you're still living as you did before you were saved with no remorse of conscience, still living in the same old sins with no change at all. I want to make sure you understand your sin problem and who Jesus really is and why he really died and was buried and rose from the dead and was seen and went back to heaven and sat down. And the necessity that you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way. He, when you turn to Jesus, he makes you want to repent of your sin. He gives you a new heart. That's not to say we won't struggle with our sins. I know. I know what struggle of sin really is as a believer. Trust me, I know. But it'll be a struggle, but it won't be your desire anymore to stay in those sins. 
that you will want to turn daily from your sins to him. You'll have that high priest, the Bible says in Hebrews 4. Now you have Jesus as your high priest who can sympathize with, with your weaknesses. He was tempted in all things as we are, yet he was without sin. And the Bible says we can now, as believers, go boldly to his throne of grace for mercy and grace in our times of need. Boy, I've had to do that a lot. I've had to go to Jesus a lot with my temptations and the times that I failed, even after he saved me. And every time, every single time, I have found Hebrews 4.12 to be true. I've been able to find mercy and grace every time for my time of need. His grace is forever. In Jesus, there's grace for grace. Grace that keeps on coming. Grace that keeps on forgiving us. Grace that never stopped. Today, I still find myself still being delivered from my sins. <laughs> Even in my stubbornness and struggles, I'm still experiencing this salvation from my sins. But I'm just saying to you today, if your life's never changed, if you're still in your sins and doesn't bother you and you're still living in them, you need to put a big question mark whether you've truly been saved or not. And you need to get that right. You need to repent and come to Jesus. The Bible says he saves us and he keeps us. Philippians 1, 6. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who keeps us. Dr. Belcher, my old preaching professor, said it like this. Uh, in today's preaching, oftentimes faith does not include any submission or commitment to Christ. Just take what he has to offer. Commitment might come later or it might not. Discipleship might come later or it might not. But just come anyway to Jesus and take his salvation. That's not the Bible plan of salvation, he went on to say. But when we come to Jesus Christ by faith, that transaction includes regeneration, which will cause a man to throw down his weapons of warfare and, and submit his all to Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord. And he went on to say, if you claim to be saved today, but you are living for self, you had better put a big question mark beside your profession of faith. Faith without true Christian works is dead. Christ separates him, his people from their sin. This does not speak of perfection, but of the presence in a true believer's heart of a desire to live a holy life and godly life for the glory of God and Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, remember the woman caught in adultery? In the very act of adultery, and Jesus said, where are all your accusers? He had told them, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. She said, they're gone, Lord. And uh, remember what he told her at the end? Go and sin no more. Oh, folks, true salvation is when a person has met the Lord Jesus Christ and has a brand new attitude about him and the Bible and church and true preaching and sin. And that sin that held me by slavery doesn't hold me anymore. And sometimes I still give in to it. But praise the Lord, he has mightily saved me from my sins. Folks, that's salvation. I told you the story about a fellow in our church that got saved. And uh, he eventually came, heard the gospel, got saved. Told me later, he went to church, he went to work. He almost came to blows with his boss. Then he said, wait a minute, I'm a new person now. Got down on our knees and... And I prayed for my boss and for myself that we would not fight. And then later he came to me and said, I got these tattoos. I can't do anything about them. I got them put on before I was saved. But he said, these ear rings and nose rings and lip rings that I have in, I just think if Jesus cleaned up my inside, I need to look good for him on the outside. So I'm getting rid of all that, that stuff. I just want you to know that, preacher. Folks, I'm just telling you, that's salvation. That's Jesus saving a person right there. When you got a new attitude about sin and the way you were living your life. So folks, and the reason we're New Heart Baptist Church is because the Bible says in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. We've heard the gospel, folks. What are you going to do with it? We've heard that Jesus Christ is God and he became a man and he lived a perfect life 
And he died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay for our sins and to purchase a place in heaven for us. We've heard the truth that we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. And if we will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save us. We've learned that that's more than just lip profession. That's with our hearts. If we really in our hearts turn to Jesus and believe on Jesus, he will save us. What are you going to do with the gospel? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. I pray that if you're not saved, you will hear the gospel and you will turn to Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel. Look to Jesus and be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Turn away from your sins. Turn away from what you're trying to do to be saved and transfer your trust to what Jesus has done on the cross. His finished work. Trust in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Bow your life to Jesus. Commit your life to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Throw yourself on Jesus. Look to Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And folks, we know this if you're saved. Why are we keeping the best news in all of the world to ourselves? If somebody's house was on fire tonight and they were sleeping, would you go knock on their door and scream and tell them to get out of the house or would you be afraid you might offend them to wake them up? So it is with the gospel. We know people are dying and when they die, if they didn't know Jesus, they're going straight to hell. We know the truth. We can go tell them the truth. We know the gospel. Let us be about that business. And today, if you don't know Jesus, I just invite you to come right now. Um, here's what you can do. Um, you do need to say a prayer, but it needs to come from your heart. But you need to believe on Jesus. That's what saved you, to truly repent and believe on Jesus. But a prayer express, expresses what you believe in your heart. The Bible says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you would call on Jesus today, right now where you're at, right now where you're watching me, if you will call on Jesus right now, he will save you. If you will just tell Jesus, I am a sinner. Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I am. I know I deserve hell. But Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you have risen from the dead. I repent. Just saying those words won't save you. You have to repent and believe. But those words express your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm calling on you. What did the thief on the cross say? First he said, we're getting what we deserve to the other guy who was dying. He admitted his sinfulness in the presence of Jesus. And then he looked at Jesus and all he said was, Lord, he acknowledged Jesus as Lord. That means he bowed his life to him. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What the... What the publican say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. However you want to say it, it has to express the desire of your heart. I'm inviting you to repent and believe in Jesus today. Please, let us know if you do that. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you so much for the good news of Jesus Christ, that no matter how far we stray, no matter how much we've sinned, even those secret sins, Lord, we are laid open and bare before you, the one with whom we have to do. Lord, you see everything. You see our thoughts, our words, and our actions, even when we think nobody else sees us. God, you know our sins more than we even know our sins. God, wake some people up right now to their sinfulness and their danger of going into hell, even maybe today, tonight, tomorrow. Wake them up, Lord, and make them run to Jesus. Make them want to run to Jesus, repenting and believing on your son. And Lord, we do pray right now for just a great awakening in our area of people coming to Jesus. And will you help us, Lord, to be sensitive to people whom we need to share with. When you put them in our paths, make us sensitive and give us boldness to share, Lord. Trusting you to save. Thank you, Father. Thank you for those watching today, for those who are here. Save some right now, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for watching this morning. Let us know if you got saved, please.